Welcome to The Jesus Follower, a podcast about helping ordinary people be close to an extraordinary God. The goal? To help you experience the life you were designed to live in the good times, tough times, and in the moments that nobody else sees. Hi, everybody. Welcome into the show. Hello, Daniel. Hello, Andrew, and good morning to you all. Glad you're here with us today. Yes, happy Wednesday, and uh, we got an exciting show ahead of us today, and um, exciting next couple of months for our church and uh, the show ahead. I just confirmed uh, that we're going to have our first interview coming up on the Jesus Follower soon. Um, an acquaintance and, and friend, I think I've been honored to meet in the last couple of years. He's a pastor and uh, well, pastor of Liberty Grace Church in the Toronto, Canada area, and author of various books, including um, How to Grow. And um, I'm, I'm blanking on the other name, but uh, he's doing a, a lot of stuff. His name's Daryl Dash. He's going to be on the show that will premiere or air on June uh, 2nd, Friday, June 2nd. And uh, we're so excited to talk to him. And in the meantime, check out uh, his stuff. He's on online. I think his website is dashhouse.com. Uh, and um, we're very much looking forward to that. And we're talking, hopefully, getting more people on the show. Because it's something really we, we need to do together, both as a church locally and as a big church. We can have a lot to learn from a lot of different people's context and experiences. And we feel like that's really important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It'd be exciting uh, seeing different perspectives also and how to be a Jesus follower in different contexts is, is a pretty cool thing as well. And Toronto, Canada, I would imagine would be slightly different than Fairfield, Ohio. So just a bit, maybe. it would be, be a good thing to, to kind of get a good perspective on, see how the Lord's working up there. So it'd be exciting. Yeah, yeah, we're very excited. But um, today we're going, uh, talking about the sermon a little bit, and Sunday we preached, or you preached out of uh, John 3, 1 through 17, and that tied in with Ezekiel 33 a little bit. But uh, the title of that was, Do They Really Know? Talking about uh, how evangelism fits into the Christian life and our witness to the world around us. And, and let me begin with this, Daniel. Well, as you know, if you haven't watched it, this is this last episode. You can listen to that sermon and get the context for what we're talking about here. But um, we were talking about evangelism, and really sometimes I think it's hard to kind of have a good theology of evangelism, especially um, on one hand we're talking about the uh, the 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 sovereignty of God in Christ, the foreknowledge of Christ, and us being predestined, as I think it's Ephesians that says that the scriptures that talk about God choosing us before the foundation of the world, um, as the scriptures say. So, and then we talk about evangelism and Christ's command: you go out and uh, you know teach the uh, make disciples in yeah. the world, share yeah. the gospel. What is a good theological framework? with the gospel in mind for us when it comes to evangelism? Well, I think uh, one of the things that we, we have to understand, like you, you referenced is that, you know, we're commanded to, to do that by God. And so, you yeah. know, a good, a good uh, launching point, if you will, is, is that command is that understanding of the great commission is the understanding of so many things that God tells us that we are to be in the world. And, you know, whether that's a light, whether it's salt, whether it's ambassadors, whether it's making disciples, whether, you know, multiple, multiple times God gives us this kind of idea that that as his servants, as amb we are to go and we are to we are to share the gospel. And then we have so many examples in the scripture of people that after spending time with Jesus or after being saved, that's what they wanted to do, which it all it all makes good sense, I think. We know that God is sovereign and God knows and, and is in control, but um, he also is long suffering, as Peter says, and he wants all to come to repentance, as as it says there in Second Peter three nine. And and we know that God so loved the world in John three sixteen that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, and we, we, so we know that this is God's heart is for mankind. Like God loves mankind, and and He wants as many as possible to come to Him. And so I think <clears throat> understanding that that that's what God has commanded us to do, and then reading through the Scripture and seeing that that was their mission. Like when Paul and Silas, Paul and Barnabas, John Mark joined in at times, or Peter, or wherever they seem to be. 
that's what they were doing. Like they were, they were teaching, they were, Jesus even met Peter in John 21 and he said, Hey, feed my sheep, you know, and, and, and he challenged him with that. So it, it's, it seems to be that God has given us this mission to, to go out. And, and, and for me, you know, I think, okay, so God's given us that command. So, so what are we, and this is kind of how my mind processes through it. So what are we going out to do? Mm. Because, you know, a lot of times if if we go out and we just ask people that question, like, are you saved? And, and this is kind of what we talked about. There's probably a lot of people that's not going to understand what you're talking about. Um, yeah. Are, are you born again? There's probably a lot of people. So so for me, what, what God has shown me is that really my drive and framework and, and, and desire is to just introduce people to Jesus. And, mm-hmm. and so just like, you know, if, if we were to meet anybody else, if we were to meet, you know, a, a professional musician, if we were to meet a great pastor that's in the in the li- big lights and mm-hmm. we would go and tell people that we met them because they are a big deal to us to meet them. And so when we talk about Jesus, the only risen savior that came down from heaven and paid our price and rose again, like it's a no brainer that our desire would be to run and tell people, hey, I've met this guy, this savior, he's changed my life. I want you to meet him too. So, so let me introduce him to you. Mm-hmm. And and so I think I think that is at the end of the day that's what my desire God has kind of transformed in a sense my my drive. What what do I want to do? Well, I know because of 2 Corinthians 5 that we are to reconcile the world to God in Jesus Christ. Like that's that's how the world can be people can be reconciled to God. So what I want to do is I want to introduce them to Jesus so that hopefully in Jesus in a relationship with him they can have a right relationship with God. Uh, mm-hmm. But apart from Christ, they can't. And so that's really what uh, what the framework of the desire, it starts with the command and then the drive and the mission is really, I just want people to see Jesus. And, and I keep saying that, but like, how do you just see him for who he is? Not know facts about him, but actually be able to process what he's done, who he is, and whether that's the starting point for them in their journey or whether that's just a seed planted. At the end of the day, if I can leave them with a good picture painted of who Christ is and what he's done, mm-hmm. then I know the Spirit of God um, you know, is the one that transforms and the Spirit of God does the rest. And so uh, at the end of the day, that's where I want to leave them. And maybe, maybe even in in that first encounter, they say, okay, yeah, I mean, if that's who he is, I want to follow him. And that's awesome. But even mm-hmm. if it's not, and they can get a good mental, visual, heartfelt picture of Christ, and that's what they're left with. I mean, you know, when you really see him and you start understanding, you know, it changes everything. So, yeah. Uh, so really, I think that's the the evangelistic drive is that. I think we if we if we go beyond that much, we we be, it becomes so complicated. We don't want to do it, right? Uh, you know, we 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 create boxes and check check marks, and we say you have to do. Uh, and, and not that any of it's bad, but but if you just go and you say, listen, I am in love with my Savior. Mm-hmm. He's done everything for me. He saved me, and my my desire is that everybody meets that Savior because He's incredible. Right. So I'm just going to, you know, I just want to tell him what he's done for me. I just want to tell him how awesome he is and, and share the gospel with him and say, hey, look, I, I would love for you to meet him. I would love for you to see him for who he is. And and just keep it simple like that. I mean, you're, you're, you're telling the story of what he's done for you. You're telling the story of what he shared in scripture. And you're just leaving people with that story. I mean, you're leaving them with that picture and 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 hoping and prayerfully, you know, they come to meet him too. Absolutely. Right. And I think you got or touched on an important point there. If Christ himself is the gospel, if he is the word made flesh, then a lot of that stigma that we feel falls away of, because I felt that in the past growing up in a Christian home, going to Christian school, being embedded in all of it. um, In, I think my sinful thinking, if Christ becomes either separate from the gospel or simply a feature of the gospel, yeah. not the full thing, then I start to feel conflicted because on on the, the scriptures say that we are uh, you know, sinful or righteousness is as, you know, filthy rags that all are the same, you know, as the saying goes, all are the same at the foot of the cross. Like right. no one's better than another. Um, but then if you start to think about the gospel as you're forcing or you have to get somebody to do a decision, like that revivalism right. kind of mindset, not like that's a dirty word, but that mindset, like you have to close the sale kind yeah, of a mindset, yeah, yeah. Yeah. then that becomes difficult. And I feel uncomfortable because it just, 
I've seen that it reeks of a lack of self-awareness where on one hand you're saying that I'm a sinner just like you, I'm unclean, but also I have something far better than you do and you need to do what I say Yeah, or else you're wrong, you know? Yeah, so yeah. it's not really consistent, uh, you know, if you're going from that end to the other end. So if Christ is the gospel... And all we're doing, we, we don't have to, making disciples doesn't mean for, or, you know, making someone say a prayer. Yeah. That's not the end of discipleship. Yeah. And neither is, you know, getting them to a certain point here in life. If making a disciple is introducing them to Christ so they can follow Christ and Christ leads them, then there really is a lack of pretense involved in that. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's crucial to making that, uh, you know, making it make sense in a believer's mind because it is true that not it's it's not common, yeah, today, and a lot of people don't do it. I have trouble doing it, and it's not a expectation of the Christian life today to make disciples. Really, it's a lot of, you know, whether we mean to or not, it's a lot of uh, self care, and that's great, but it starts there and ends there, oftentimes, right. Um. So yeah, if Christ is the gospel, then that uh, it changes a lot. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, I it is a lot of self care. I think, and and we do kind of get away from that. And and uh, I think you know when you read the scripture, it's the main thrust. I mean, it's like you know Jesus sends them out. You know, he sends them out a couple different times, and then. You know, after he he goes to be with the father, you know that that's their threat. They're going and they're sharing, like because. And, and I think that 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 one of the things that's the most challenging is it has to be real to us. And, mm. he, and even to me saying that, I it's hard to articulate it to me because you know it, it's it's so easy for me to have a head knowledge of what Christ has done, but it not to be real, like it, it not to me, not to, to fully immerse myself in understanding, you know, what all that implies. I mean, what all, how, how, how deep that love and that grace is. And, and, and it's got to be real. And, and the real component comes with an intimate relationship with Jesus. So mm -hmm. the the closer you are with him, the more that that you're processing. Okay, these these stripes he took were for me. You know, this yeah. these bruises were mine to have, and 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 that cross was not his to bear. Really, that was mine. That's where that that I literally should have been there. And mm -hmm. and, and when you start thinking about it like that, because if it's not real and it's only an idea, you disconnect yourself from what took place. Yeah. And, and at that point, it's just factual statements about, you know, a generalization of dying for the world. But no, you have to you have to bring it to yourself. He died for you. And oftentimes mm. I've heard people say that, like, if I, if you were the only one on the world, he would have still died. Uh, and we have to we have to kind of process through that, I think. And with all the scripture, I would say process through it like that, like like this is real. This is you're not disconnected from this. This applies to you because God shared it to you. God shared it to us. God provided it for a purpose. And so it, we can't just like separate ourselves and, and say, well, that was just, you know, that was just them during that time when the reality is, is that God is timeless and he is all knowing and he knows that, that we need this word or he wouldn't have shared this word with us. And, and I think it's so important. And with, with evangelism, I, I believe that should be the effort. I mean, I think we as a church, even when you think about the concept of ambassadorship, ambassadorship doesn't start in the home country. Ambassadorship is meant for outside the walls of the country. And mm -hmm. with the church, you know, when Second Corinthians 5, when he says that we are ambassadors, it, it kind of to me says, you know, outside the walls, like we, we are to, and what do you need to be sharing? Well, of course, the gospel. I mean, you need to share Jesus mm -hmm. because, because peace and hope and life and, you know, none of that come, reconciliation that doesn't come apart from him. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, you know, in my mind and, and, and in my heart, when I read the scripture, I see that is just, that's the thrust. I mean, yes, we make disciples. So we introduce them to Jesus, Lord willing, they're born again. And then the church activates as a church and we say, all right, now we're going to, let's pour into them. Let's pour into them. And then we'll walk beside of them as they, they go out and make disciples and then they'll bring and they'll pour in and they'll pour in. And, and it's just this, but, but you're right. I mean, I think it's so huge what you said that really that's not what we're thinking about oftentimes. 
Uh, we're we're mm-hmm. not thinking about making disciples. We're thinking about a lot of other things, uh, and a lot of them centering around self care, and and that that becomes problematic because we know that in the book of Acts, God was moving. Um, yeah. So so then we have to ask the question: What were they doing for God to be moving in such a mighty way? And, mm-hmm. and and we can study that like they were they were praying they were together often they were in the scripture they were sharing the gospel they were persecuted you know a lot of times I mean but God was saving as they were proclaiming God was saving souls by the thousands right and yeah and he's the same God today as he was then and the same he, he can do the same thing today as he did then but we just have to be focused and directed the same way that he would have us to be directed or they were directed then I think toward him so and it kind of redefines, I think, it makes us redefine even concepts like self-care um, or evangelism as we know it in terms of being legalistic or not. But self-care doesn't mean staying in and protecting yourself at all costs. That's where I would go if, uh, you know, just yeah. being introverted. And uh, that's not necessarily what that means. Jesus redefines things like that. But also, I think it it if you look at a doctrine like election, even, you were talking about the importance of being Jesus died for me, he died for you. There is a sense where he died for the batch, the church, but yeah. but individually Christ gets glor- glory ultimately as he sees fit in saving, choosing individuals apart from their works, as the scripture says, or anything that they've done for his uh, glory. Yeah. And that being by his word and his name being spread to others. And it yeah. doesn't have or it doesn't correlate necessarily with those good works. It's never it never says that, you know, God earns our good works by by it, it's it's not about the works, even though it's a, a byproduct of it. We receive he receives glory through those works in our life, but by his people praising him and his choosing us by a free act of grace, that is his glory, and it's his, his grace being shown to his sinful people. So with that, it's freeing. I know oftentimes it can be seen as a hindrance to the gospel, that doctrine of election saying oh, yeah. our evangelism, like this person's elect and this person's not, but really that's a misunderstanding of the doctrine entirely. Yeah. If it's not for us ever to know if someone is elect or even if if we are, we know because we're in Christ and that's how we know, but really that might be the way someone is brought to Christ is through your witness or through my witness, and that then or therein lies the importance of actually telling someone about it. Yeah. It's easy to just say, well, they'll see me by the way I live my life, know I'm different, and then it'll just kind of happen, spontaneously combust, and yeah. <laughs> they'll become Christians. But there has to still be that step where you tell them about Christ, yeah. which is difficult. But if we look at the doctrine of election as saying, like like Paul said, I, I might be taking that out of context, but Paul says that uh, we're completing the work that um, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, that Christ left undone on the cross. Like we're, we're uh, finishing Christ's work of redemption. Uh, I'm not saying it right, but there, there's something to that end that um, God, Christ didn't automatically just resurrect everyone after the cross or with his resurrection. We are here to make disciples, yeah. and that's the way God um, determined that his glory be best known. So with that, you can have the strength and the Holy Spirit to uh, you know, approach that friend in strength and empower and say, uh, you're you're on my heart and you're not gonna tell them they're elect. But you know, <laughs> yeah. with that mindset that you're coming in the power of Christ and not in your own power, because that is how God is going to choose to save that person, if he will. Yeah. And that's up to him ultimately, but we we are his mouthpieces in that. Yeah. And, and we know that's his, his desire. Yes. Um, and so, says, you know, right. it's, 
It's it's and and we and like you said, we don't know. I mean, the Bible does talk about predestination, election, but we don't know. You know, I mean, right. so so in reality, even when people proclaim, sometimes we may not really know. I mean, it's between them and God. You know, we can we can trust them, and we can look at fruit. We can be fruit inspectors, if you will. But uh, but but you're right. I mean, we can't take that and say, oh well, um, God's got this all under wraps because at the foundation of it all, as we talked about at the beginning, you know, He commands us to go. I mean, yeah. and and so like if He gives us command he's the king then that's what we do and and we trust him with the results and the outcome we just at the end of the day and i love that about paul was that paul said you know he talked about running a race and wanting to win the prize and some people look at that and say uh well paul was just uh he was self-centered he just wanted all the glory for himself but no in all reality at the end of his life when he stood before jesus he wanted him to be the most pleased possible with him as as he could be and he says i want to do the best the best the best because I want my Savior to be honored in what I'm doing. And, and mm-hmm. so he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run for Jesus effectively with all that I can, not, not to hold it over anybody's head, not to say, well, look at how great I am and my accomplishments. As a matter of fact, he put his accomplishments out there and he said, they're nothing compared to what Christ has done for him. But he mm-hmm. said... I, I'm going to do it because I want to honor him. I want to please him. And and I think we can all see that's the example Jesus said. I mean, Jesus was teaching people. He was telling people. He was going to the Samaritan. He was going into the synagogues. He was going to his disciples. He was, I mean, he was teaching about the kingdom. He was trying to share truth with the world. And so if we're going to follow and claim to be Jesus' followers— it's so monumentally important that we do the things that Jesus did, and we follow suit with the way that he lived and, and follow his footsteps. I think Peter talks about that, uh, about following the footsteps of Jesus. Uh, he says in verse in First Peter 2.21, For even here too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. And, and I think that's what we strive to do is to follow the steps of Jesus. And mm-hmm. that was that was the design. I feel like, you know, he he discipled, he discipled, he discipled, he sends out. He disciples, he sends out. Uh, and then when the when he resurrected and, and has finished it and has sat down on the right hand of the Father and completed it, then then they go out. You know, then uh, and when they're kind of standing around, you know, it feels like almost sometimes persecution comes and it scatters them out. And where do they go? They do, they share the gospels, they go out, they just keep sharing, keep sharing. Uh, and and I so I think that that is that is the pattern and the design from the Savior, and that's why we strive to do just that. Right, definitely. I I love how Jesus says to Nicodemus, uh, just looking at the passage as you preached in John three, the metaphor that Jesus gives to him to explain salvation is being born again. And too often today we can present, I think our power is lost as we've kind of gone, you, you know, we've mentioned in multiple ways, but if we present salvation as praying a prayer, doing this or doing that, that's not being born again. You can't control that. Nicodemus says, how do I, how do I do that? I can't jump back into my mother's wound kind yeah. of thing. Um, so with that, it presents great power in our evangelism and in our, uh, you know, witness and great hope is that even though we do call people to a life change, it's not of themselves. That's right. And that's what makes the gospel the gospel. It's not you telling someone to be better or do better or whatever. It's uh, meet Jesus, yeah. the one who can transform you. That's right. Really, and that's... Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right, and and I I would say this, and I know, uh, just just as a, and I shared this on Sunday morning, if you were able to see it, but be be prepared, but don't be alarmed by follow up questions, and, and I just want to, uh, so have yeah. the expectation, but don't panic when they come, and and I think Nicodemus is a great uh, a great resource that we can go into the Word of God and see this because the the, the greatest evangelist Jesus, uh, you know, he he shares he. He 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 uh, addresses the follow up questions and and I think you know a lot of times that is what hinders us from doing what we're commanded to do and when it comes to evangelism when it comes to sharing the gospel because.
because we're afraid. Mm -hmm. Well, we may not know how to answer the follow up questions. Well, Nicodemus had a couple follow up questions. And, you know, Jesus said, be born again. Like you said, Nicodemus said, well, how can that be? Jesus explained it further. He said uh, in verse nine, he said, how can these things be? And so uh, I would just say, like, uh, and I think it goes with our expectation. If we go into it and we know, okay, there's a possibility that people are not going to understand and there could be some follow up questions. Yep. You know, at the at worst case, you say, you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer, but I'll find the answer for you and I'll bring it back to you. And there's nothing right. wrong with that because nobody is, knows everything on this earth anyway. Uh, and so that's okay. But the reality is, is that they may ask a question. You may say, well, you may not be prepared for it, but the spirit of God, we can't discount what the spirit of God is going to do through you in the life of that person. Mm -hmm. So we know that God gives us the, the voice and the words, and we don't have the truth or the word that needs to be said without the guidance of the Lord or without his word. And so we go into that and we say, okay, even if they come, we'll trust God and have faith that his spirit will do what only his spirit can do. Yeah. And and we may feel like, we may leave and feel like, ah, I missed it. But we can't discount God's part in the whole process. Like, even if you or I think we missed it, you know, God can do a whole lot with what we think is a weak area or a failed area to transform that and to make that seed stick and to do what only he can do. And so I would just, I would say that to you and when it comes to sharing your faith, when it comes to sharing the gospel, know that there, especially in our world today, be prepared for follow-up questions, but don't panic at them. Right. You know, trust, trust God to do what he can do through your life, even in the follow-up. Yeah, and that should we we don't mean to talk about like things like you know self care with disdain because that's important. I think in that similar vein of that, you got to give yourself a lot of grace in terms of yeah. that, and that should give us we, we we should have that in our theology of what the gospel really is. Because again, it's not a gospel of Jesus has made me better. Uh, and you, you'll make me better. He'll make you better too, in terms of moralism or having all the answers. Or you're not meant to be the poster child of everything good. Yeah, you know, yeah that's right, not. Right. You're not the gospel. Christ is the gospel. That's right. He will change your life, and that's part of it. But it's only because of Him. Yeah. So, with that, fine. If you don't have all the answers, that scared me too, and it still does, really. And it's easier to sit here and say that now than actually. <laughs> do it yeah, granted right. <laughs> but um but yeah i in my uh when i worked in sales for a brief time they did um make the point too they get called it a uh, objections you know raise it when a uh you know a, someone you're selling to raises an objection of what about this what are you know you have to answer those questions in yeah. a similar way um it, it it's often perceived as a bad thing like you know especially in evangelism like you didn't uh uh, give the the whole story or that you told something in a wrong way or that they don't understand. But really, if someone's raising an objection, it's oftentimes a good thing that they care enough about what you're saying to, uh, you know, hear it and try and compute it in their mind and then ask a follow up question because something even just because of their context or something not because of you yeah. might not be fitting completely into their understanding. So there's probably even reason to be encouraged by follow-up questions because engagement is better than, well, most of the time there could be a off chance that someone's just being snarky. Yeah, But yeah, yeah. Um, if it's a true objection, if you will, being raised, then that can be a very good thing. Yeah. It, yeah. And it beats indifference, you know? Yes. You know, because I Every think- time. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, people just brush you off and they're not processing because it is something to be processed. I mean, it is something to, to, to think about and mull over a little bit because it's a, it's kind of a big, it's a big deal. It is a big deal. Like, I mean, and even the decision to come to Christ, that's a big deal. Like, you know, that, that persecution probably will be a part of that at some point. If you're living for him, Jesus kind of indicates that that's kind of what we see in his life. And we know that, that, that transformation will come. So the things that you do, possibly you won't be doing those anymore because you're turning away and turning toward him. So 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 there is a sacrifice. I mean naturally that there was a great sacrifice for our our leader and savior. So yeah. uh so yeah, I think I think the follow up is good. It doesn't feel good probably. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. but but it no. is because you know you want people to engage and, and like you said there will be those that will be aggressive. But if if we frame it in the right way, like Christ did with the, the woman at the well, or like Christ did with the, the adulterous place before him, like Christ did so many times, 
then then even if there would naturally or normally be aggression, it may be softened by that love that you yeah. show in truth and uh, and so so even at that, you know, we don't have to panic. I mean, I think if we frame it like Christ, that it just makes all the difference, you know? Right. And if that's the worst case scenario, then we don't have a lot to worry about. Yeah, <laughs> you that's know, right. It's, uh, you know, I do, we, we, we talk about, um, you know, the morals of our, our nation are not trending towards Christian morals, but um, we still live in a country where our right to proselytize is protected and even encouraged yeah. by the constitution. Yeah. So we are ultimately protected. And really, if most of the time you're not going to be knocking on a random person's doors and, uh, you know, you know, telling him about Jesus, that, that's probably a good thing to do uh, sometimes. But, um, I, I could see that really is the only reason if you know someone and you're in a friendship with someone, you tell them about something that matters to you. They're not going to scream in your face, yeah. <laughs> really. No, that's I would, not going to happen. It. Yeah, yeah, because they care about their image. Yeah, just as much as you do yours, and probably even more so if they don't have Christ. So, yeah. um, so be encouraged in that. We didn't even address at the beginning. You got really dressed up for this podcast today, <laughs> and you're uh, if you're watching on YouTube or even. We have video on Spotify now. You're just taking the podcast very seriously, very seriously. more than me in just, a sweatshirt. But uh, you get to preach a celebration of life today, and um, we got to let you go for that here in a few. But um, any last things, encouragements, anything we haven't touched in terms of evangelism uh, to send people off on their Wednesday? Uh, well, let me just share this really fast. So we uh, in Ezekiel 33 was the tie-in to this passage, and and it was a tie-in because I'm a person that 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 thinks in illustration form, and it's one of the easiest, simplest ways for me to illustrate the gospel, to illustrate our mission, uh, and and God shares with Ezekiel about being a watchman. And, mm -hmm. you know, the whole process of a watchman was, you know, you designate someone to be on the wall so that they're keeping an eye out for danger to come. And when danger comes, then then they spring into action. So it's really a, a twofold concept or process. I see it as one, you're watching for danger and identifying danger. OK. Uh, and mm -hmm. so for you and I, like, I mean, when, when it comes to following Jesus, there is a danger in not following Jesus. Uh, there, there is a danger yes. for those that don't. And so as as watchmen, I can see if it's illustrated this way, I can see that as we look out at the landscape of the world, we know, according to Scripture, uh, that if people die without Jesus, it's a dangerous scenario, right? There's a, mm -hmm. an, an eternity of separation from God to pay as a result of, of standing on the account of your works only and not the finished work of Christ. So, uh, so as a watchman, we can say, well, there is a danger. We know what's coming. There's eternity coming one way or another. Yeah. And Jesus is the difference. The second component of the watchman is once he sees the danger coming, he's going to answer for how he responds to everyone else when he sees the danger. So, for example, if the danger comes and he doesn't blow the trumpet, then and, and the people die, then the people's blood are going to be on his hands. Uh, but if he does blow the trumpet and the people don't listen, then he's done his part and the blood is not on his hands. And I can see that. I, I believe that for you and I that know that we are to share the gospel, if we don't share if we make no effort, if we don't share, we have a family, we have a friend, we have someone, we have a relationship, we know they're lost, and we don't say a word about Jesus. I have to believe uh, that that we will be account, we'll be held accountable for those things. I mean, I believe we'll have to yeah. come face to face with that, yes. because God has told us, look, share share Christ as an ambassador, as a light. Like this is what you do. He's the greatest one ever. Mm -hmm. Why would you not, if you know that danger's coming for that lost person, why would you not blow the trumpet and say, listen, I can tell you about a way to escape the danger. I can tell you about a redeemer that's paid your price. Why would we not? And so when I think about that, I'm like, man, I know that I have missed opportunity that mm -hmm. one day I'll probably answer to God for. Mm -hmm. But but if I can help it, I don't want to miss the opportunities, no matter how uncomfortable it may be, because I believe the Bible when it says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And apart from him, we're not getting to God. Right. And, and so and, and I don't care how how bad you mistreat me or how much I, I don't get along with you. I don't desire, and I'm sure most of you would say the same, if not all of you, I don't desire anybody to go to hell. I don't mm -hmm. desire anyone to die without Christ and to experience eternal separation from God. 
I mean, I, I don't. And so it's like, it doesn't matter. Like you said, and we talked about sometimes people could be aggressive. It's probably not, not often, but, uh, but it doesn't really matter. Even if they are, I would take that aggression a little bit if I could just introduce them to Jesus and maybe they wouldn't have to go to eternity without right. him. Um, and so I, I, I just would share that just in closing today. Uh, that is That gives me a great picture of the importance of our job, uh, the importance of our privileged opportunity to represent a perfect Savior in the world around us, to mm-hmm. think about it in the perspective of a watchman. Okay, Ezekiel, God said, this is what you, you got to tell them. You have to tell them what I'm telling you. Now, they're not going to listen a lot of times. And a lot of times we'll share Christ with people and they may not listen. But we still, as meeting the only Savior of the world, have a responsibility to tell the world that he is the source of redemption, that he is the source of life, that he is the one that can redeem and forgive and make new and bring about an adoption and a reconciliation. We still have the, the, the responsibility, I think, the privileged responsibility to share that with the world. Mm-hmm. Right. An ultimate ill of our culture today is what's in it for me. Ah, no. We only do yeah. things because it benefits us. And that's ultimately in the world today how, you know, culture operates. Yeah. So much buying, selling, getting ahead. And Christianity changes that yeah. in the sense of there is a responsibility to tell because in Christ we know what's coming, as you mentioned. And we 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 see people around us, and that's an ultimate outflow of the gospel. As Christ cares for people, so we care for people if we're really in Christ. So we do have that responsibility because we know what's coming. And even though we might not receive the full benefits of that now or face rejection, if you know, if the the old adage, if you saw a car coming towards a person and you didn't, you know. Tell them, yeah, then, yeah. Uh, then you're, you know, you don't really love the person. But really, we can see this as a spiritual blessing to ourselves. It doesn't have to be either or. In the gospel, we aren't employees of God to, you know, to save people or to we we weren't we weren't saved, and then we have to pay back our salvation by being this watchman and going through some sort of right, you right. know pseudo purgatory kind of thing yeah. by repaying for our sins. And I think we can get there in a term in a form of legalism. I think if we stop and end at those metaphors of you know the car coming at the person, because oftentimes that involves you lunging out and tackling the person or pushing them away. And really the sad truth is we can't do that. We can't force someone into salvation or to a decision. And even if it's just a decision, it might not be true. Then yeah. we have to face that as a reality of this thing that only Christ get. you know, it's the power of the Holy Spirit That's that right. changes hearts. And we can't do that. Nonetheless, it's our job to share the gospel, so we really have to push back against this uh, either-or kind of thing that we can deduce logically because of our cultural you know, placement in America. We don't do it for the you know, the lead conversion, if you will, for a sales term. We don't do it for the sale, or yeah, we don't do it yeah, for yeah. the number. Yeah. We do it because Christ commands us and our love for Christ, and out of that blessing of the gospel that Christ gave us, we're in the family of God. Right. So we can do God's work now, not as an employee, but being on God's team, a part of God's family. Yeah. And that's something we really have to fight to believe and that to influence our action, Yeah. because it's if we if we see it as a matter of I need to do this because I'm a Christian, then we're not going to do it. Yeah, and, yeah, and I no. haven't done it in the past because it feels both logically dissonant, as you know we talked about earlier, to the gospel of being saved only by grace. How can we be saved only by grace and then have to do these works afterwards to be proven a Christian? That's not it, no. and neither is it to just out of a desire to be better or moralism, anything besides the love of Christ, it's not going to work. So we can't stress enough the importance of right belief and knowledge and not just Bible reading, but reading for understanding and reading for the gospel and for Christ, because that's what's going to drive our witness and not just an abstract need to tell people about being a Christian, because that's not what it's about. That's right. It all comes 
from the love. I mean, love is the driving factor. You know, the greatest of these is love. You know, he talks about that uh, and he references that. And we know that God is love. And as you love you, uh, as you love more, uh, the overflow of that love will will pour out in you and you propagating or, or presenting the gospel, not because of it's a it's a uh, apart from uh, just a, a job, but a privilege instead to tell people and introduce people to to the Savior. And so, yes, it is a it's a very big thing that you got to fight against because sometimes religion will 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 make it into this. Uh, you must this demand, but instead it is uh, it is definitely a privilege because we have been in Christ adopted into the family of God and we get the privilege to serve him. And that's awesome. So that's absolutely right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Danny, for talking about this today. Thank you for being here. I'm very encouraged and challenged, and I uh, hope you are as well. And please send your comments to us or questions. Um, at our emails in the show notes. Mine's Andrew at fourfairfield.com. His is Daniel at fourfairfield.com. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, we're a ministry of Rolling Hills Baptist Church in Fairfield, Ohio, and that's kind of our atmosphere here. So uh, learn more about our church. We'd love you to get connected uh, to us or to a church in your area. So visit us at fourfairfield, F O R, fairfield.com. And uh, we'll be back on Friday with yeah. part two about uh, inerrancy of Scripture. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, look forward, forward to being to with you then. Thanks for joining in, and and hopefully, hopefully, it's uh, it's encouraged slash challenged as, as as the word so often does to to all of us that look at it because you know we're chasing after a perfect Savior. We want to be right with Him, and uh, and I got a long way to go. So, me so, too. Yeah. Definitely. Y'all have a great day though in the Lord. Thanks for being with us today. We'll see you Friday.